Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we gather here this morning in your presence. For you the one who binds us, who draws us together, who calls us to come and to be with you. So we do pray, O Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to your presence. That you would make room in us for that which you desire to impart, for that which you desire to work in us. For we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, before I get into the sermon, I have to ask, is there anybody who is here, who was here when this place got started 50 years ago? Anyone? Anyone? So you're all newcomers, right? Oh, wonderful day. Congratulations. Second question. This is for grandmothers. Are there, is there anybody that calls you Nana? Is that a name that you know? Oh. Nana actually plays a role in the Old Testament lesson this morning. But Nana is not a grandmother in this story. <laughs> Abraham, you see, is a Babylonian when the story that we hear happens when God calls Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees, the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians, and to call them, calls him to go with all of his family, servants, flocks, and herds to literally start a whole new nation, a nation that doesn't even exist yet, the nation of Israel. And at the time, since Abraham was a good Babylonian, for all that we know, the god that he worshipped was called Nana. The oldest reference that we have for that name is not to a kind grandmother at all, but to, to the very fierce god of the moon that was worshipped by the Sumerians and this Babylonian group of which Abraham is a part. I mention that because, not just to sort of give you an interesting factoid, but also to be able to say that when we have this story, which, which many of us have heard, it, for the readers of Genesis, it was a very surprising story. Because you see, all of this happened before the formation of the nation of Israel, the giving of the law, all of the stories that many of us heard about them being captive in the Red Sea, being set free, coming back, taking a new land, the promised land, and establishing the kingdom of Israel. At this point, what you have here is a Babylonian nomadic family, people of significant wealth, lots of servants and flocks and the like, and God, whom they only know as the Sumerian moon god, literally speaks to Abraham in a voice and calls him to leave everything that he knew, everything, to go to a land that he doesn't know anything about. Remember, people back then didn't travel the way we do. And to literally put his entire family and fortune at some risk for the sake of leaving this land and taking them all into treacherous country where they would face robbers and kings who wondered why this huge entourage was coming into their nation. Who are you? See, this was not done at all. In fact, you'll see later in the story, if you read the book of Genesis, there were people who thought, is he coming to take over? Does he have an army? I mean, they always expected the worst. There was no rational reason that this very well-established, well-to-do family with all of their flocks and herds would leave their homeland and go to a place that they'd never been before. That's shocking. Absolutely countercultural. Not what they would have been expecting at all. And yet, this is how the nation of Israel begins. And it is this that Paul references in the book of Romans when he talks about the fact that Abraham believed. In other words, a voice speaks to him. We don't know whether he's ever heard this voice before. 
And now the mic's going in and out. We'll just make do, okay? <laughs> and the, that voice, he recognizes as God, as a deity speaking to him. And he's willing to do what that voice tells him to do. I need to tell you, if somebody came to you and said, I'm supposed to basically sell all of my resources and move to Bali or to move to Rwanda or someplace like that, and God is telling me that, you know, this voice is telling me that I'm just supposed to start all over, we think they're delusional. We wonder if they shouldn't be on medication, right? I mean, I want you to understand how entirely out of cultural character this incident, in fact, actually is. So that you can understand why Paul places such tremendous importance on this. Because even though there was no evidence except for the voice, Abraham was willing to believe the authority of that voice. And not just believe, but act on it. Literally uprooting everything he knew and going into this entirely different country. The point that Paul is trying to make is that he's saying to, in essence, particularly the Jewish contingent in the Roman church, because the church in Rome was a mixture of people from all kinds of religious backgrounds, all of whom had come to faith in Christ. Jew, Gentile, they could have worshipped the Roman pantheon. I mean, all kinds of things are possible. Remember, Rome is an extraordinarily cosmopolitan place. So there were people there from literally all over the Mediterranean world. So they had nothing religious in common except for their faith in Christ. We have churches that sort of grow almost by mutual affinity. Churches grow in part because people gathered were sort of like each other culturally, or in age, or in preferences, and things like that. And so and they say to one another, come and be a part of this church, you'll like the people there. They're nice people. And that almost always is a euphemism for, they're people like us. That's not true for the Church of Rome. The Church of Rome was incredibly racially and culturally diverse in every way that you could imagine. What held them together was this common faith in Christ. And so what Paul is trying to do is to teach this Roman group what faith in Christ actually means. And he uses Abraham as his example. Because Abraham... It's a Babylonian. In other words, he's not a Jew, so that would relate to a certain part of that group. Also, however, he's the father of the Jewish nation, so all of the Jews hold him appropriately or so in profound personal respect. And, more importantly than either of the racial issues, Abraham had a relationship with God prior to the giving of the Ten Commandments and the Law of Moses. And the reason that's important is because the Jewish contingent was very clear. If you actually want to have a relationship with God, the way you have to do that is to obey the law. Because that's what is pleasing in God's sight. And so no matter where you're from, whether you be pagan or Jew by background, the fact of the matter is, is if you're going to worship the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have to obey the Mosaic law. And Paul is going, no. That's not it at all. Because look at you Jews, look at the father of faith here. Did he believe the law? The law hadn't even come into existence yet. That's generations later when Moses goes to Sinai, which is why there's all this language in the Roman lesson about being justified by the law. And he says to the non-Jews, look, you have a hero. You have a hero in someone who was obedient to coming out of, in fact, the paganism with which many of you are very familiar, to come and believe in the true God and to obey Him and follow Him. In other words, He's your heir. You are His heirs too, and not the Jews. How could Paul even begin to make that declaration? Because he believes and understands with all of his heart, and this is the whole thrust of the book of Romans, is that what puts us right with God is not obedience to a set of commandments, but a relational faith in him, of which Abraham, you see, is prime example. 
This is incredibly important because you see, we live in a church situation where many of us have this kind of, I don't know, sometimes it's over in this covert or this covert sense that somehow God's going to love me more if I do things that are right. That he'll pay attention to me if I'm obedient to him. Or the caliber of how well God thinks of me has everything to do with how well I'm behaving. <laughs> how many of you heard of, have heard those kinds of things, right? If God's going to pay attention to my prayers, then I better do what he says, right? That all of those things are just new phrases for being justified by the law. In other words, the caliber of my relationship with God is directly related to my performance as a human being. Because that's what the law says. Mm -hmm. The law says, you obey the law, you're right with God. You don't obey the law, you are not right with God. And there are plenty of churches, but this is not in the Bible. There are plenty of churches that say, in essence, some version of the very same thing. Mm -hmm. If you do what we say, or if you obey the Bible the way we, says, we say the Bible is, then God will love you. He will receive you. He'll make you his child. He'll care about you. And Paul is trying to say, no, 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 no. That's not it. Because here's the dilemma. The dilemma is, is that if my acceptance before God is based upon the caliber of my performance, I'm always going to live in some kind of guilt. Right? Scripture is pretty clear. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So if you want to, you can even include, look at your neighbor and say, not that means you, but that means me too. See? All of us are in the same boat together. We all have places in our lives where we sin and where we know it. Yes. And we also have places in our lives where we sin and we probably don't know it, but other people do. Right? Come on, let's be real. And because it's so, and unfortunately what happens is that when a church, especially a church, accepts this, the idea that somehow what makes you right with God is not faith in Christ, but the caliber of your performance, it creates an environment where we are incredibly judgmental toward one another. Because we're insecure ourselves, you see. We know that we don't always do it right. And because we do that, and if we know that's what God wants, you see, then I, I come in knowing that I'm not probably not right with God this morning. And I don't want to talk about that, you see, and I don't want to even perhaps face that. So what do I do to divert the attention off my own inadequacies and my own shortcomings? Did you see what she did? Because <laughs> that takes the spotlight off me and puts it on somebody else. That kind of gossip is almost, all, in a church community, is almost always based on a misunderstanding of what it means to be right with God. It's not just an issue of personal insecurity. But if I know that no matter where I've been, no matter what I've done, or what I've not done that I should have, I can go to God and say, I know I'm your child and that you love me. And that I can come to you and ask for your forgiveness, and you always give it. You never turn to me and say, uh, haven't you talked to me about this before? <laughs> How many times must I forgive my brother? 70 times 7, you see? Which is a euphemism for, like, every single time. <clears throat> that's, that's free. And for the legalists, it makes them very nervous because they say, oh, oh, no, no, no. You see, if you do that, then that means that you can get away with whatever you want and you just know God will forgive you. But I, I want to say that that's actually a misunderstanding of what it means to be made right with God based on faith. Because if I actually know that the deepest part of my heart where the sin is, is in fact cleansed in the presence of God and that he loves me in a way that nobody else does. He knows all that's in my heart, every single thing that's in there. And he loves me as I am. What that does inside of me is that that creates in me such a profound level of gratitude. The one place in the universe where my heart is home is in his presence. 
oh gosh, even though I know I sin, the last thing I want to do is offend him. The one who has shown me love like no other. So just the opposite. If I really get the fact that I am unconditionally forgiven, and that he loves me with an everlasting love, that I am, to use Paul's language, justified in his sight based on faith, not works. There is inside of me a level of, it's like the song you guys sang, peace and ease in the presence of God that no religious system could ever make happen for me. Because every single religious system, I'll fail. I'll do my best, but there will always be that list of the things that I wish weren't there. Right? Nod your head. And so this is great news. You see, the, the Christian gospel is supposed to be good news. Meaning, hooray, it's really true. As opposed to, oh, moral law. That's not good news. And so even at the opening collect, when Cranmer, one of our founders and a brilliant theologian, he's very careful to pray. Did you notice this? Look at the collect. In your insert, did you get one? If, if he did not understand that we are in fact made right with God out of relational faith, he, if he didn't believe that, he could not have put what he put down in this collect. Where he prays, O God, whose glory it is, always to have mercy. Well, that in and of itself is a showstopper. You mean no matter what? No matter what? Are you real? See? Always to have mercy. Be gracious to all who have gone astray through your ways. And notice, he doesn't say, and hope they come back real soon. <laughs> Instead, what he prays is, bring them. Bring them. In other words, no matter where they are, no matter how far they've wandered away, literally like the stories that Jesus tells of the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to go find the one, come and find them wherever they are. And literally put your arm around them and bring them back into the presence of God. And it is that love that in fact creates the penitent heart and the steadfast faith. So, question. Do you understand? Do you know in your heart of hearts? Is there a rise of peace and gratitude in you to know that what makes you right with God is not church attendance, it's not faith and Bible reading, it's not any of those things. They're all good. But that's not the, that's not the real bottom line. The real bottom line is, is that He loves you. He's forgiven you. And he's, he's invited you to come into a relationship with Himself. And it is that relationship that saves you and makes you whole. Not your performance. And if you honestly believe that, that means there's mercy and peace in your heart, even at this very moment. Even at this very moment. And that you know that He will never leave you or forsake you no matter what happens. And that you can count on Him in a way that actually is not true for any human relationship. All of us fail one another. Right? And we also enjoy each other's company. But a part of what it means to be human is to forgive. Have to. Otherwise you live all by yourself. But in Jesus, He is the one who always forgives. Whose love does not change. Why? Because He understands who we are. And He's willing to say, come and be with me. No matter what. I will never leave you or forsake you. That is saving faith. And honestly, nothing else. So this morning, we're about to go into confirmation and reception. They're saying, I'm willing to take God up on that invitation. And for those of you who have been confirmed and baptized, 
You've also said that too, whether you knew it or not. So if that's new news for you, as they are making these commitments, I would encourage you to renew your own. And understand that what makes you right with God is the gift of what He gives you in this invitation of a relationship that is absolutely unbreakable in His presence. Because this is good news. And that's what matters. Everything else is just religion. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, no matter where our heritage has been, what part of the world we're from, we thank you that we can come to you and that you receive us as we are and that we can say, I believe, and you can say, you are my sons and daughters, I will never let you go. And that we, no matter where we've been or what we've done, can receive forgiveness and mercy that we can, in fact, as John says, be born again into your kingdom, not because of what we have earned, but rather because of what you choose to give us. And so we thank you for what it is that you have given us in your Son, and for the grace and the mercy and the very peace that is in our hearts, because we belong to you. Thank you, O Lord, for who you are and what you have given us in Jesus, your Son. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.